Hello everyone, welcome to this exclusive CUBE conversation. We have the pleasure today to welcome Wim Coker, Senior Vice President of Software Development at Oracle. Wim, it's good to see you. How you been, sir? Good, it's been a while since we last talked, but I'm excited to be here as always. It was during COVID though, and so uh, I'm hoping to hopefully see you face to face soon. But so Wim, since the Barron's article declared Oracle a cloud giant, we've really been sort of paying attention and amping up our coverage of Oracle and asking a lot of questions. Like, is Oracle really a cloud giant? And I'll say this, we've always stressed that Oracle invests in R&D, and of course there's a lot of D in that equation. And over the past year, we, we've seen, of course, an autonomous database is, is ramping up, uh, especially notable on Exadata Cloud of Customer. We've covered that extensively. We covered the autonomous data warehouse announcement, the blockchain piece, which of course got me excited because I get the to talk about crypto with Juan, uh, Roving Edge, which, which for everybody who, who might not be familiar with that, it's an edge cloud service, dedicated regions that you guys announced, which is a managed cloud region. And so it's clear you guys are serious about cloud. These are all cloud first services using second gen OCI. So Oracle's making some moves, but the question is, what are customers doing? Are they buying this stuff? Are they leaning into these new deployment models for the databases? What can you tell us? You know, definitely. And, and I think, you know, the reason that we have so many different services is that not every customer is the same, right? One of the, one of the th things that people don't necessarily realize, I guess, is in the early days of cloud, lots of startups went there because they had no local infrastructure. It was easy for them to get started in something completely new. Our customers are mostly enterprise customers that have huge data centers in many cases. They have lots of real estate local. And when they think about cloud, they're wondering how can we create a, an environment that doesn't cause us to have two ops teams and two ways of managing things. And so they, they're trying to figure out exactly what, what it means to take their real estate and either move it wholesale to the cloud over a period of years, or they say, hey, some of these things need to be local for maybe even for regula regulatory purposes or just because they want to keep some data locally within their own data centers but then they have to move other things remotely. And so there's many different ways of, of solving the problem. And you can't just say, here's one cloud, this is where you go and that's it. So we basically say, if you're on-prem, we provide you with cloud services on-premises like dedicated regions or Oracle Exadata Cloud at customer and so forth so that you get the, the benefits of what we build for cloud and spend a lot of time on. Uh, but you can run them in your own data center or people say, no, 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 I want to get rid of my data centers. I do it remotely. Okay. Then you do it in Oracle cloud directly. So, or you have a hybrid model where you say some stays local, some is remote. The nice thing is you get the, the exact same API, the exact same way of managing things, no matter how you deploy it. And that's a big differentiator. So is it fair to say that you guys have, I think of it as a purpose-built cloud, because I talk to a lot of customers. I mean, I take, 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 a, I take an insurance app like Claims, and customers tell me, I'm not putting that into the public cloud, but you're making a case that it actually might make sense in your cloud because you can support those mission-critical uh, applications with the exact same experience, um, same API, same, I can get, you know, take Rack, for instance, I can't get, you know, real application clusters in an Amazon cloud, but I presumably I can get them in your cloud. And so I, is it fair to say you have a purpose built cloud specifically for the most demanding applications? Is that a right way to look at it or, or not necessarily? Well, it's interesting. I, I think the, the thing to be careful of, of is, I guess, purpose built cloud might for some people mean, oh, you can only do things if it's Oracle centric, right? And so, so I think that fundamentally Oracle Cloud provides a generic cloud. You can run anything you want, any application, any deployment model that, that you have. Whether you're an Oracle customer or not, we provide you with, with a, a full cloud service, right? However, um, given that that we, we, we know and have known obviously for a long time how our products run best, when we designed OCI Gen 2, when we designed the networking stack, the storage layer and all that stuff, we made sure that it would be capable of running our more complex environments. Because our advantage is Oracle customers have a place where they can run Oracle the best, right? And so obviously the, the context of purpose built fits that model, where it is we've made some design choices that allow us to run Rack inside OCI and allow us to deploy Exadatas inside OCI, which you cannot do with other 
on in other clouds. So yes, it's purpose built in that sense, but I would caution on, on the side of that it it sometimes might imply that that it's unique to Oracle products. And and I guess one way to look at it is if you can run Oracle, you can run everything else, right? <laughs> because it's such a complex suite of products that if you can run that, then it, it'll support any other right. deployment. Right, right, it's like New York City. You make it there, you can make it anywhere. If I can run the most demanding mission critical applications, well then I could run a you know web app, for instance. Okay, um, yeah. I got a question on tooling. Uh, there's a lot of tooling, I sometimes my, makes my eyes bleed when I, when I look at all this stuff. And, and I'm, doesn't, square this circle for me. Doesn't autonomous and autonomous database, um, like autonomous Linux, for instance, doesn't it eliminate the need for all these management tools? You know, it does. It, it, it eliminates the need for the management at, at, the, at the lower level, right? So with autonomous Linux, what we, what we offer and what we do is we automatically patch the operating system for you and make sure it's secure from a security patching point of view. We eliminate the downtime. So if when we do it, then you don't have to restart applications. However, we don't know necessarily what the app is that is, is installed on top of it. You know, people can deploy their own applications. They can run third party applications. They can use it for development environments and so forth. So, so there's a, there's sort of the, the core operating system layer and on the database side, you know, we take care of database patching and upgrades and, and storage management and all that stuff. So the same thing, if you run your own application inside the database, we can manage the database portion but we don't manage the application portion, just like on the operating system. And so, so there's still a, a, a management uh, um, level that's required no matter what, a, a level above that. And there's the, the other thing, and, and I think this is what, what, you know, what a lot of the stuff we're doing is, is, is based on, is you still have tons of stuff on premises that needs full management. You have applications that you migrate that are not running autonomous Linux, could be a Windows application that's running, or it could be something on a different Linux distribution, or you could still have some databases installed that you manage yourself. You don't want to use autonomous or you run a third party. And so we, we want to make sure that we can address all of them with, with a single set of tools, right? Okay, so I wonder, can you give us a, just an overview, just briefly of the, the products that comprise mm -hmm. in the cloud services, your, your management, solution what's in that portfolio how should we think about it yeah so so it kind of it, it it basically starts with enterprise manager on premises right which has been the tool that our, our oracle database customers in particular have been using for many years and and is is widely used by by our by our customer base and so so you have those customers most of their real estate is on premises and they can use enterprise manager the local they have it running and and they don't want to change it they can keep doing that and we keep enhancing as, uh, as, as you know, with, with newer versions of enterprise management getting better. So then there's the transition to cloud. And so what we've been doing over the last several years is basically looking at the things, well, one aspect is looking at things people like of enterprise manager and make sure that we provide similar functionality in Oracle Cloud. So we have a performance hub for, for looking at how, how a database performance is working. We have APM for application performance monitoring. We have logging analytics that looks at all the different log files and helps make sense of it for you. We have database management. So a lot of the functionality that people like in enterprise management for managing the database that we've built into Oracle Cloud and um, you know a number of other things that are coming, operations insights to look at how databases are performing and how we can potentially do consolidation and stuff. So we've we've basically looked at what people have been using on premises, how we can replicate that in Oracle Cloud, and then also when you're in a cloud, how you can make make use of all the the base services that that a cloud vendor provides, telemetry, logging, and so forth. And so it's a broad portfolio, and it what it allows us to do with our customers is say, look, if you're predominantly on-prem, you want to stay there, keep using Enterprise Manager. If you're starting to move to Oracle Cloud, you can first use EM, look at what's happening in the cloud, and then switch over, start using all the management products we have in the cloud and let go of the Enterprise Manager instance on-premises. So you can gradually shift, you can start using more and more. Maybe you start with analytics first, and then you start with insights, and then you switch to database management. So there's there's a whole suite of possibilities. I've been, you know, you mentioned APM. I've been watching that space. Um, it's really evolved. 
I mean, you saw, you know, years ago, Splunk came out with sort of log analytics, maybe simplified that a little bit. Now you're seeing some open source stuff come out. Uh, you're seeing a lot of startups come out. You saw Cisco made an acquisition with AppD and that whole space is transforming. It seems that the, the future is all about that end-to-end -end visibility, simplifying the ability to remediate, you know, problems. I, 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 and I think I'm thinking, okay, you just mentioned you guys have a lot of these capabilities. You got autonomous. Is that sort of where you're headed uh, with your capabilities? It, it definitely is. And in, in fact, one of the, so, so, you know, APM allows you to say, hey, here's my web browser and it's making a connection to the database through a middle tier. And it's, it's hard to, it's hard for, for operations people in companies to say, hey, the, the end user calls and says, you know, my order entry system is slow. Is it the browser? Is it the middle tier that they connect to? Is it the database that's overloaded in the backend? And so APM helps you with tracing, you know, what happens from where to where, where the delays are. Now, once you know where the delay is, you need to drill down on it. And then you need to go look at log files. And that's where the logging piece comes in. And what, what happens very often is that these log files are very, very difficult to read. Like you have networking log files and you have database log files and you have OS log files and you almost have to be an expert in all of these things. And so then with logging analytics, we basically provide sort of an expert dashboard system on top of that, that allows us to say, hey, when you look at logging for, for the network stack, here are the most important errors that we could find. So you don't have to go and, and learn all the details of these things. And so the real, the, real, um, the real advantage is of saying, hey, we have APM, we have logging analytics, we can tie the two together, right? And so we can provide a solution that, that actually helps solve the problem rather than you need to use APM from one vendor, you need to use logging analytics from another vendor. And you know, that doesn't necessarily work very well. Yeah, and that's what you're seeing with like the Elk stack. It's cool, you're an open source guy. It's cool, it's open source, but it's complicated to set up all, all, you know, all that that brings. So that's, a, that's kind of a cool approach that you guys are taking. You mentioned Enterprise Manager. You just made a recent announcement, a new release. What's, what's new in that new release? So Enterprise Manager 13.5 uh, just got released. And, and so EM, E EM keeps improving, right? We've made a lot of changes over, over the years. And, and one of the things we've done in recent years is, is do more frequent updates, sort of the cloud model, frequent updates that are not just bug fixes, but also introduce new functionality. So people get more stuff more frequently rather than you know once a year. And, and that's certainly been very attractive because it, it shows that it's a, a lively evolving product. And one of the main focus areas of course is cloud. And so the, a lot of a lot of work that happens in enterprise manager is hybrid cloud, which basically means I run enterprise manager and I have some stuff in Oracle Cloud. I might have some other stuff in other cloud vendors environment. And so we we can actually see which databases are where and, and provide you with one consolidated view and one tool, right? And of course, it supports autonomous database and exadata in in cloud servers and and so forth. So you can. You can, from EM, see both your databases on premises and also how it's doing in, in Oracle Cloud as you potentially migrate um, things over. So that's one aspect. And then the other one is in terms of operations and, and automation. One of the things that, that we started doing, again, with Enterprise Manager in the last few years is making sure that everything is a REST API. So we try to make the experience of Enterprise Manager be very similar to have people work with a cloud service. Most folks now writing automation tools are used to calling REST APIs. EM right. in the early days didn't have REST APIs. Now we're making sure everything works that way. And one of the advantages is that we can do extensibility without having to rewrite the problem. Right? We just add the API calls and the agent and it makes it a lot easier to, to become part of a modern system. Uh, another thing that, that we introduced last year, but that we're evolving with more dashboards and so forth is, is the Grafana plugin. So even the enterprise manager provides lots of cool tools, a lot of cloud operations folks use a tool called Grafana. Sure. And so we provide a plugin that allows customers to, to have Grafana dashboards where the data actually comes out of enterprise manager. So that, that allows us to integrate EM into a more cloudy, world in a, in, a, in a cloud environment. Um, and then the, I think the, the other important part is um, making sure that again, enterprise manager 
has sort of a cloud feel to it. So when, when you do patching and upgrades, it's, it's basically, it's near zero downtime, which basically means that we do all the upgrades for you without having to bring EM down. Because even though it's a management tool, it's used for operations. So if there were downtime for patching enterprise manager for an hour, then for that hour, it's, it's, a, black, it's a blackout window for all the monitoring you do. And so we want to avoid that from happening. So now EM is upgrading, even though all the events are still happening and being processed. And then we do a very short switch. So that helps our, our operations people to, to, be more, to be more available. Yes, I mean, I, I've been talking about automated operations since, you know, lights out data center since the eighties back in, <laughs> I remember touring a data center one time, lights out, there were storage tech libraries in there. And, and so, but, there were a lot of unintended consequences around, you know, uh, automated ops. And so people were sort of scared, uh, you know, to go there, at least lean in too much, but now with all this machine intelligence. So you're talking about ops automation. You mentioned the REST APIs, the Grafana plugins, the cloud feel. Is that what you're bringing to the table that, that's unique? Is that unique to Oracle? Well, the, the integration with Oracle in, in that sense is, is unique. So one example is, you know, you mentioned the word migration, right? And so database migration tends to be something, you know, customers obviously take very serious. You go from one place, you have to move all your data to another place that runs in a slightly different environment. And so how do you know whether that migration is going to work? And you can't migrate a thousand databases manually, right? So automation, again, it's not just, it, automation is not just to say, hey, I can do an upgrade of a system or I can make sure that, that nothing is done by hand when you patch something. It's more about having a huge fleet of servers and a huge fleet of databases. How can you move something from one place to another and automate that? And so with EM, you know, we start with sort of the prerequisite phase. So we look at the existing environment, how much memory does it need, how much storage does it use, which version of the database does it have, how much data is there to move. Then on the target side, we see whether the target can actually run that environment. Then we go and look at, you know, how do you want to migrate? Do you want to migrate everything from a sort of a physical model or do you want to migrate it from a logical model? Do you want to do it while your environment is still running so that you start backing up the data to, to the target database while your existing production system is still running? And we do a short switch afterwards or you say, no, I want to bring my database down. I want to do the migrate and then bring it back up. So there's these different deployment models that we can let our customers pick. And then when the migration is done, we have a ton of health checks that can validate whether the target database will run basically the exact same way. And then you can say, I want to migrate 10 databases or 50 databases and it will it'll work. It's all automated uh, out of the box. So you're saying, I mean, you look at the prevailing way you've done migrations. Historically, you'd have to freeze the code and then, and then migrate and it would take forever. It was a function of the number of lines of code you had. And then a lot of times, you know, people would say, well, we're not going to freeze the code. And then they would almost go out of business trying to merge the two. You're saying you can, in, in 2021, you can give customers the choice. You, you can migrate <laughs> you could change the, you know, refuel the plane while you're in midair. Is that essentially what you're saying? That's that's a good way of describing it. Yeah. So your existing database is running, and we can we can do a logical backup and restore. So while transactions are happening, we're still migrating it over, and then you we, you can do a cutoff. So it makes the the transition a lot a lot easier. But the other thing is that in the past, migrations would typically be two things. One is one database version to the next. More, more upgrades and migration. And the second one is I have old hardware or a different CPU architecture and moving to newer hardware and a new CPU architecture. Those were sort of the typical migrations that you had prior to cloud. And from a sysadmin point of view or a DBA, it, it was all something you could touch, right? You could physically touch the boxes. When you move to cloud, it's this nebulous thing somewhere in a data center that you have no access to. And that by itself creates a barrier to a lot of admins and DBAs from saying, oh, it'll be okay. There's a lot of concern. And so by baking in all these tests and the prerequisites and, and all the dashboards to say, you know, this is what you use. These are the features you use. We know that they're available on the other side. So you can do the migration. It, it helps solve some of these 
problems and remove the barriers. Well, that was your kind of same, same vision when you guys came up with it, I don't know, quite a while ago now. And it took, it took a while to get there um, with, you know, you had Gen 1 and then Gen 2, but, but that is, uh, I think, unique uh, to, to Oracle. I know maybe some others are trying to do that as well, but, but you were really the first to do that. And, and so I want to switch topics to talk about security. Um, it's a hot topic. You guys, you know, are, are like many companies really focused on security. Does, does enterprise manager bring any of that over? I mean, the prevailing way to do security oftentimes is to do scripts and write, you know, custom security policy. Scripts are fragile, they break. What can you tell us about security? Yes, so we, we, there's really two things, you know. One is we, we obviously have our own best security practices, um, how, how we run a database inside Oracle for our own world. We've, we've learned about that over the years. And so we've sort of baked that knowledge into, into Enterprise Manager. So we can say, hey, if you install this way, we, 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 we do the install and the configuration based on our best practices. That's one thing. The other one is there's STIG, there's PCI, and there's HIPAA. Those are the main ones. And so customers can do their own way. They can download the documentation and do it manually. But what we've done is, and we've done this for a long time, is basically bake those policies into Enterprise Manager. So you can say, here's my database. This needs to be PCI compliant or it needs to be HIPAA compliant. And you push a button and then we validate the policies in those documents or in those prescript described files and we make sure that the database is compliant to that. And so we take that manual work and, and all that stuff out, basically out of the picture. We say, push this button and we'll take care of it. Now, Wim, but just quick sidebar here. Last time we talked, it was, it was under a year ago. It was definitely during COVID and it's still during COVID. Um, we talked about the state of the penguin. So I'm wondering, you know, what's the latest update for, for Linux? Any, any Linux developments that we should be aware of? In Linux, we're, we're still, you know, working very hard on autonomous Linux. And that, that's something where we can really differentiate and, and, and solve a problem. Of course, one of the things to mention is that Enterprise Manager can, can do HIPAA compliance on, on, on Oracle Linux as well. So, so the, the security practices are not just for the database, it can also go down to the operating system. Anyway, so on, on the autonomous Linux side, you know, uh, management in an Oracle Cloud's OS management is, is evolving. We're spending a lot of time on integrating log capturing and, and if something were to go wrong that we can analyze a, a log file on the fly and send you a notification saying, hey, you know, there was this bug and, and, and here's, here's the, the cause and, and here's potentially a, a fix for it through, through autonomous Linux. So we're putting a lot of effort into that. And then also sort of IT slash operation management where where we can look at the different applications that are running so you're running a web server on a linux environment or you're running some java processes we can see what's running we can say hey here's a cpu utilization over over the past week or the past year and then how is this evolving so if something suddenly spikes we can say well that's normal because every monday morning at 10 o'clock there's a spike or this is abnormal and then you can start drilling this down and this comes back to over time integration with whether it's APM or logging analytics, we can tie all the dots, right? We can connect them, you can say, push this thing, then click on that link, we give you the information. So it's that integration with the entire cloud platform that, that's really happening now. Integration, there's that theme again. I want to come back to migration, I think you did a good job of explaining how you sort of make that non-disruptive and you know, your customers, I think are, you know, generally you're pushing you know, that, that, that experience, which is, which makes people more comfortable. But my question is, why do people want to migrate? If, if, it, if it works and it's on-prem, are they doing it just because they want to get out of the data center business or is it a better experience in the cloud? What can you tell us there? Uh, you know, it's a little bit of everything. You know, one is of course the, the idea that data center maintenance costs are very high. Um, the other one is that when when you run your own data center, you know we have we obviously have this problem. But when you're a cloud vendor, you have these problems. But but we're in this business. But if you if you buy a server, then in three years that server basically is depreciated. You buy new versions and right. you have to do migration and stuff. And so one of the advantages with cloud is you push a button, you have a new version of the of the hardware, basically, right? So the the, the refreshes happen on a regular basis. You don't have to go and and recycle that. Uh, yourself. Then the the other part is, 
is the subscription model. It's a lot easier to pay for what you use rather than you have a data center, whether it's used or not, you pay for it. So there's there's the cost advantages of, of the end predictability of what you need, you pay for, you can say, oh, next year we need to get X more VMs and, and it's easier to scale that, right? We take care of dealing with capacity planning. You don't have to deal with capacity planning of hardware. We do that at the cloud vendor. So there's all these, these practical advantages you get from, from doing it remotely. And that's really what, what the appeal is. Right. So as it relates to enterprise manager, was that, did you guys have to like tear down the code and, and, and rebuild it? Was it an entire like redo? How, how did you achieve that? No, no, no. So, so enterprise manager keeps evolving and, and you know, we, we changed under, we changed the underlying technologies here and there um, piecemeal, not, not sort of a wholesale replacement. And so in 13.5, there's a lot of new stuff, but it's built on, on the existing, on the existing EM core. And so we're just, you know, improving certain areas. One of the things is stability is important for, for our customers, obviously. And so by picking things piecemeal, we replace one engine rather than the whole thing. It allows us to introduce change more slowly, right? And it's, it's well tested as a unit. And then we go on to the next thing. And then the other one, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the automation and extensibility comes from REST APIs. And so instead of basically rewriting everything, we just provide a, a REST endpoint and we make all the new features that we, we built automatically be REST enabled. So that makes it a lot easier for us to introduce new stuff. Got it. So if, if I want to poke around with this new version of Enterprise Manager, can, can, I, can I do that? Is there a place I can go? Do I have to call a rep? How does that work? Yeah, so for information, you can just go to oracle.com slash enterprise manager. Uh, that's the website that has all the data. The other thing is if you're already playing with Oracle Cloud or you use Oracle Cloud, we have enterprise manager images in the marketplace. So if you have never used EM, you can go to Oracle Cloud, push a button in the marketplace and you get a full enterprise manager installation in a matter of minutes. And then you can just start using it as well. Awesome. Hey, uh, I want to ask you about, um, you know, people forget that you, you guys are the stewards of MySQL. Um, and, and we've been looking at that MySQL database cloud service with, with Heatwave. Did you name that? And, um, <laughs> and so um, I wonder if you could talk about what you're doing with regard to, to managing Heatwave environments. So yeah, so Heatwave is the MySQL, MySQL option that makes that, that helps with analytics, right? And it really accelerates MySQL usage by you know 100x and, and in some cases more and and it's transparent to the customer. So as a as a MySQL user, you connect with standard MySQL applications and APIs and SQL and everything. And the Heatwave part is all done within the MySQL server. The engine itself says, "Oh, this SQL query we can offload to the backend Heatwave cluster, which then does in-memory operations and blazingly fast." returns it to you. And so the, the nice thing is that it turns every single MySQL database into also a data warehouse without any change whatsoever in your application. So it's been widely popular and, and it's it's quite exciting. I didn't personally name it Heatwave. That was not my decision, but it sounds very cool. So That's it's, very uh, good. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very cool name. <laughs> well, we love, um, my, we and, love MySQL. We started our company on yeah. the LAMP stack, so like many. Right? Oh, so, yeah. yeah, 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 it's great. So yeah, and, and so with, with Heatwave, or MySQL in general, we're basically doing the same thing as we, we, we have done for the Oracle database. So we're, we're going to add more functionality in our database management tools to, to also look at Heatwave. So whether it's doing things like performance hub or generic database management and monitoring tools, we'll expand that uh, in, you know, in, the, in the near future, in the future. That's great. Well, Wim, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming back in theCUBE and let me ask all my Colombo questions. It was really a pleasure having you. You're welcome, always good to be here. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. And thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time.